Dan Goldfield, welcome to the podcast. Jack Moses, thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, I always love talking about this intersection of like mindfulness, spirituality, meditation, and how it intersects with business and entrepreneurship. So I couldn't think of a better guy. Ah, thanks, brother. I'm flattered. And indeed, <laughs> this is the intersection that's fascinating me the most right now. The mindfulness stuff, as you know, I've been into for years. The business stuff is new to me. So seeing how these collide and interact and fizz and pop together, it's a very exciting spot to be in. 100%. So we could probably take this a million different directions to start, but I want to start with where people will start with you, which is your bio on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a very compelling bio. It's like, I remember reading it for the first time and I was like, whoa, who's this guy? So mm. let's start off with the first part of it. It says, I studied with a monk for five years. So can you tell me the story? How did that originally come up? And what was that experience like? Because most people never do something like that. Sure. So the first thing I have to tell people about this is that most of that study was remote. Now, A, there's not enough space in the Twitter bio to talk about that. B, it doesn't fucking matter anyway. We're all studying remotely in the 21st century. I did go out and visit this guy. Spent a month out in Thailand in 2017. But I spoke with him like we're speaking right now for hundreds and hundreds of hours. I found him through Reddit. I'd been listening to a lot of one-to-many teachings. And uh, I started to hear a lot of teachers talking about the value of getting together with a teacher yourself. So I was like, I want that. I want to talk about my stuff, right? I've heard all the one-to-many teachings. I've got the idea. Now I want to have a conversation with someone who lives this shit. So this teacher lived as a monk in Thailand for eight years with a teacher called Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, who's very famous in Thailand. And then he was sent out of the monastery to teach on the internet. So that's where he was doing his outreach. That's where I came across him and uh, I learned a lot. Out of all the things you learned, what was the main takeaway that sticks with you to this day? To dissolve the boundary between meditation and non-meditation. Mm, okay. So I'm assuming what you mean by this is you can be meditating all the time. I know Naval has talked about that in his podcast. Is that on the mm -hmm. right track? Absolutely. And what does that look like in practicality? This. <laughs> it looks very ordinary. Now, it's worth making the distinction when we talk about meditating all the time, we're of course not talking about being in a deep state of concentration, a deep state of absorption all the time. That's impossible. We wouldn't be able to cross the road, right? The Buddha laid out four states of absorption that he called jhanas. And these are widely recognized. The first of those jhanas is either very similar or the same as what we now call flow state, depending on who you talk to. Some will say it shares characteristics. Some will say it's the same thing. Practically, it may as well be the same thing. We feel good. We're able to focus. No distractions. We're operating well. All the stuff that we care about. So that's what we're doing when we're meditating all the time. And what this teacher said to me, the way he framed it was, look, if something's good, if something good is happening in your meditation, why not make it happen all the time? And so I set about that. I started practicing like I was practicing when I was sitting. Only instead of focusing on my breath, I was focusing on walking is an easy one. We hear about walking meditation all the time. But what about driving meditation, talking meditation, listening meditation, shitting meditation? <laughs> it's all available. And we can indeed meditate on absolutely anything. Now, what happens as we do this is everything eventually opens up. You completely dissolve that boundary, first of all, between meditation and non-meditation. But then you dissolve that boundary between driving meditation and getting out the car meditation, getting out the car meditation and walking meditation. And what I found and many other practitioners have found is that actually in the end, what we discover is that meditative stability is our natural condition. We are naturally clear and lucid and effective. 
in every moment. It's a flip. What's actually been going on all our lives is we've been distracting ourselves. We've been putting stuff in the way. We've been attached to stuff, trying to push stuff away in our experience, trying to pull stuff to us that we don't have. And that obscures our natural lucidity, our natural clarity. So as we meditate more and more in more situations, we stop doing that stuff. And that's the whole game. So it's a subtractive process. Yeah, this concept has been so interesting to me lately from a little bit of a different lens. So it actually comes full circle to, I just finished writing my newsletter for this week and it's talking Mm -hmm. about finding your life's work. And I was rereading Mastery by Robert Greene. And he says, Mm -hmm. the first step towards mastery is always inward. And he goes Mm -hmm. really deep into finding what you were doing as a child like obsessively that you couldn't tire of. And it brings us back to this idea of like, as children, like we were, we knew everything. I think Aristotle said something like that. And Mm. inherently, if we knew this meditative state, but yet we lost it, it's something that we could all gain access to. Now, I think the problem for a lot of people is the term meditation. I, I, a lot of people say to me that, don't really meditate or they never have. They say, I don't know how to meditate or I'm not good at meditation, but you're saying you can be meditating all the time. So if you could define it, like what is Mm. meditation Mm. and like, can somebody be good at it? Can somebody be bad at it? How does that work? Yeah. It's all about how we view it. It's all about perspective. Meditation is the dedication of distraction, free time to the practice of mindfulness mindfulness is the quality of seeing clearly so all we're interested in is seeing things as they are accepting things as they are without our interpretations judgments labels or descriptions and it's those interpretations judgments labels and descriptions that lead to all the confusion that we experience they are the confusion that we experience because the moment we interpret something we're thinking about it Ramdas said that the problem with thinking is we think about things. We're always one thought away from reality. So all we're looking to do is to stop doing that, right? We, we were conditioned from that childlike innocence. We were conditioned into, well, you must think about things. You must decide what you think about things. We think this is good and that is bad. And so you better think that too, little Jack. Otherwise... You're out of approval and you'll be punished, right? This begins at home and then it continues in school. And it's just layers on layers on layers on layers of conditioning until we feel like we we can't let go of it. We're completely identified with this interpreting, judging, labeling, describing. And so when people say they can't meditate, what they're effectively saying is they can't turn that off. They can't stop doing all those mental processes that they've been so thoroughly trained into. And I remember this. I remember what this was like. It's terrible. It's a terrible condition to be in. It's essentially chronic thinking. That's what we're raised into. That's the norm in our culture. And so what people tend to need is something of a more deliberate practice to get started, which is what I did. First of all, I was doing the typical guided meditations. Then when I met this teacher of mine, I was then practicing what the Buddha called Anapanasati which just means mindfulness of breathing. As is, everyone knows the classical meditation is you focus on the breath. But this method actually expands to a very complete and comprehensive practice. You practice first on the breath, then on the whole body, then on the feelings, then on the mind, and then on truth. So it's a 16-step practice, but this teacher of mine wonderfully described how that practice is more like the steps of a dance than the steps of a march in that they can come in any order so anyone who's interested who's checking out this conversation can just google anapanasati spelt as we would expect a-n-a-p-a-n-a-s-a-t-i lots of vowels in there (laughs) and uh you'll see these 16 steps laid out by the buddha Some of them will seem clear. Others might be a little bit mysterious. Just throw them in chat GPT and 
GPT will give you a reasonable explanation for what the Buddha meant by that stuff in plainer language, or indeed reach out to me. This is actually, as an aside, this is one of my major goals with my outreach is to democratize all this stuff, to make it simple, to put it into plain language. Because if we start using Buddhist terminology with people, we'll lose them. There's, no one's got time for that, right? But it can all be explained in plain language. Indeed, if it couldn't be explained in plain language, it wouldn't be true. <laughs> it would be a contrivance. It would be something made up, something fabricated, something abstract. Right. But the Buddha was interested in truth. So if we're interested in truth, then this has been a, one of my favorite developments on my journey has been to learn how to put this stuff into plain language. And so for those who feel that they can't meditate or that they're bad at meditating, it's just about trying some things out. I try to give as simple instructions as I possibly can. Where I begin with a student these days is I say to them, rest naturally without seeking or describing anything. And they'll say to me, Dan, that's too simple. <laughs> and I'll say, okay, so then we'll do this. We'll do a four-step practice. The first step is to go to a distraction-free environment and get comfortable. The second step has three parts. Part A is to relax, which means in this case to accept things as they are. To accept things as they are. Part B is to stop wishing things were different. And part C is to quiet down, or as I sometimes like to say it, to shut the fuck up. <laughs> stop commenting on stuff. Stop that mental chatter. Now, people will hear this instruction and they'll immediately say, well, I can't. I can't stop it. And I'll say, okay, well, just stop it now. Just for a brief moment. Just again, just to whatever degree you're able to stop that mental chatter or relax it. Can you make it 10% slower, 10% quieter, right? So accept things as they are. Stop wishing things were different and shut the fuck up. That's part two, okay? Part three, step three, is that when we notice tension or distraction, which we will in this practice, is to acknowledge that as successful practice. This is key. All that conditioning, all that training that I mentioned just moments ago, one of the things that it builds up in us is a tendency to berate ourselves, to tell ourselves off. So that most people, when they sit down to meditate, they say, okay, I'm going to focus on my breath. And then when they notice that they're not focusing on their breath, they say, fuck! I'm supposed to be focusing on my breath. I'm such a bad boy, <laughs> right? And they'll just be cracking the whip the whole time. Well, that's an unpleasant process, which means no one's going to continue with it. That's why everyone tries it for a while and then drops off. So what we need to do is look a little deeper and say, well, we need to flip that script to where instead of telling yourself off when you're not focused, you congratulate yourself for noticing that you're not focused. Right, Because all we're doing is we're studying the mind here. We're looking at what's going on in the mind. Right. Step four is to repeat. So once again, we accept things as they are. Stop wishing things were different and shut the fuck up. When we notice tension or distraction, we acknowledge that as successful practice. And we'll just loop that round. This creates a pleasant practice that's enjoyable when we enjoy the practice, we want to do it. When we want to do it, we do it a lot. When we do it a lot, we see what we need to see. Wow, that was a great explanation. Um, yeah, I think the hardest part for me and for a lot of people is escaping that thinking mind. And mm. to really be able to turn it off is very rare. And I think most people don't ever see that or experience what that feels like. Mm. I have felt like I've been on the other side of my thoughts at times, a, a couple mm. of select times, not consistently. And mm. my experience has been aided by psychedelics, but I know meditation mm. gets you to the same spot. So you're obviously an expert meditator, at least by my standards. In your bio, it says you've meditated 29,000 hours and I did the math and that's like three and a half years. So for somebody who's starting off and they can't escape the mind, 
how long for you did it take to turn that off? And how long could somebody expect roughly, I know it's probably different for everybody, but how long could somebody expect to practice to get to the point where they're on the other side of their thoughts to where Mm. the mind Mm. is only active and the rational mind is only thinking when you need it to think. Cause I know Ram Dass has talked about that as well as you were talking about him. Yeah. So good news. We actually don't have to shut the mind down to that degree. This is, this is a miss. Well, it's sometimes a misunderstanding. Some teachings actually at least imply or outright, demand (laughs) that we do actually shut down the mind i spoke about those four jhanas earlier this would be character characteristic of deeper states of meditative absorption that that thinking would stop or at least some kinds of thinking would stop what we're really interested in is what perceives thinking there's something about us that's not a thing (laughs) but we have to speak about it in these terms. There's something about us in which, as which, by which, and through which those thoughts occur. And that something is present whether thoughts are around or not. And so if we can identify with this, then it no longer matters to us whether we're thinking or not. And indeed, all of our thinking then is in the position of servant as opposed to master this something that i'm talking about that's not a thing is awareness the most fundamental non-thing about our being the only facet of our being that is around all the time even if we focus on the breath well there's space between the breaths or we can hold our breath So the breath sometimes isn't around. So the breath isn't the most intimate thing about us. The body isn't the most intimate thing about us because in our direct experience, we're not always having an experience of the whole body. Our thoughts are not the most intimate thing about us because sometimes we're thinking, sometimes we're not. Even in the busiest of minds, sometimes there is space. Someone cracks a joke and you start laughing. Well, where's the intrusive thoughts then? So there's always space. That space itself is awareness. And so if we change our focus instead to focus on what is fundamental about our experience, we pull the rug out from under the whole thing. doesn't matter if we're thinking or not thinking, healthy or sick, happy or sad. It doesn't matter. Now, someone might hear this and think, well, that sounds scary. What if I end up sad all the time? More good news. You are happy by your nature. And we have hundreds of millions of monastics over thousands of years have confirmed that when they get quiet, they get happy. They get kind. They get effective. They get what outwardly would look like disciplined. But they're just having a nice time. Now, monks are, of course, at various stages in their journey. We're talking about realization here. And how long might that realization take for someone? It varies. I like the word recognition here. Realization is close. Recognition is even closer because what we're looking to do is recognize something that's already the case. It's already the case that awareness is the most fundamental thing about being. And as we identify with that awareness, instead of the judgments, labels, interpretations, descriptions that we make. Awareness doesn't judge. Awareness doesn't describe. Awareness is aware of judgments. Awareness is aware of descriptions. Right? So that's what we're looking to get to. And as we recognize this more and more, first of all, with a glimpse, then with another, then with another, until we gather enough evidence to see yeah, this this is who I've always been. Everything else about myself has come and gone. Everything I've ever taken myself to be has had a beginning and an end. Only awareness has always been on in my direct experience. And this is an important distinction. Wise teachers talk a lot about direct experience as distinct from something that you've read 
or heard somewhere, something that someone else told you. So we're always looking to confirm in our direct experience what's true. And so I encourage anyone who's listening here to confirm what I'm saying in their direct experience. Are you the body or is the awareness of the body more fundamental to your being? Check it out. We have the assumption as a scientific community that awareness is generated by the human form. Usually we would assume by the brain. Yet in our direct experience, if we ask the question, does awareness appear within the body or does the body appear within awareness? Then we have some interesting territory to explore. And if anyone falls down this rabbit hole as they're listening to me speak, they're welcome to reach out in a DM. <laughs> well, I kind of want to go down this rabbit hole now uh, that Perfect. we're at this topic, because as you're talking about this, I'm noticing and I'm trying to sit in that awareness, right? I think mm. that's what Michael Singer talks about in The Untethered yes. Soul. It's sitting mm. in the space behind the thought. It's si sitting in the seat of awareness. So mm. When you say you're meditating all the time, are you sitting in that awareness 24-7? Is that what exactly you mean by that? And if so, precisely, are there things that pull you out? No. And here's why. It's because it's so simple. When we see that what we thought was pulling us out in the past was just another experience known in as by and through awareness then again it has this quality of kind of pulling the rug out from the whole thing we see that any experience we've ever had of being distracted or being seduced by some gratifying phenomenon well we were aware of that too awareness is always on so when we gather enough evidence that what we are is awareness fundamentally then there's no chance of it being off we, we see that that's the case and we see, well, I've always been aware of everything that's happened to me. Now, again, this may give the impression to the listener that, that then, well, okay, so what, am I just going to end up at the bar every day? I mean, if, if, you know, there's no distinction between I've always been aware. And so I recognize that, well, how does this help me in my life? Well, it helps us because awareness again, doesn't judge, doesn't describe, doesn't label awareness, doesn't get stuff wrong awareness sees everything exactly as it is and awareness has another wonderful quality which is that it naturally tends toward mutual benefit and this is a wonderful uh, distinction that a great teacher that i've spent much much time listening to called zizi rinpoche someone asked her one time how do you know if someone's really enlightened there's been a lot of charlatans in this game over the millennia a lot of people claiming some kind of spiritual attainment who were really just looking to make a buck or do whatever. Who knows what motives people had, but there's a, a rich history of people uh, leading folks astray. Well, Zizi Rinpoche said, it's simple. Someone who is enlightened or awakened or whatever you want to call it is of benefit. They naturally benefit themselves and others and they're not trying to do it it's not by means of some grand plan they just get up in the morning and well how am i gonna benefit everyone today and again looking to our largest sample size of people who have realized this stuff the monks we see that they are naturally compassionate they don't complain about stuff they're just doing good deeds all day every day now another place that we get tripped up on this in the 21st century is our means of exercising mutual benefit now look very different to what they did in ancient monastic communities. And so we get caught up in romanticizing about the way that wise people have done things over the millennia. And we think, well, I'm just sat at my laptop all day. I can't be enlightened. <laughs> or projecting to the future, if I'm sat on my laptop all day, I couldn't possibly be enlightened. And so we think, well, I must have to change something about my behavior in order to get enlightened. I better go and check out the monastery or I better 
put a shrine somewhere in my home and I better meditate four hours a day and I better do all these rituals. I've got to light incense. I've got to have photos of holy beings on the wall. And it's, it's all just stuff. It's all just stuff. And what we see with this real recognition of what is irreducible truth, which is the only thing that I've ever been interested in. What's true when I'm not saying anything? <laughs> What's true when I'm just looking and seeing clearly and of course, that comes before any judgment, label, or description, right? So what's true is when we shut our mouths, when we stop thinking about it, when we stop trying to say an answer, when we stop even trying to find an answer, the answer is right here, plain as day. It's just this. The Buddha called himself not Buddha. This was a name that was given to him. But the Buddha called himself Tathagata which from Pali roughly translates to one who is thus, or one who is just this. Ordinary, simple. This whole enlightenment thing, this whole awakening thing is so much simpler than most people make it. And it is available to everyone. There is no one who is bad at meditation. It's impossible to be bad at meditation. Now, if we're doing a meditation to try to get something, to try to get a result or to try to get into a state, then we might be bad at it. But no one is bad at being aware. It's impossible. Zizi Rinpoche says, if you tap someone on the shoulder and ask them, are you aware? They must say yes. I suppose they could lie to you. <laughs> but if they're being honest, they must say yes. So we see this is the fundamental truth of everyone's being. And the more we identify with that truth, the less problems we cause ourselves, naturally. Because why would we? Why would we cause ourselves problems unless we're confused about what's going on? That's the only time we cause ourselves problems. I've written that the only reason evil is ever uh, performed is because someone's confused about what's going to bring them satisfaction. Adolf Hitler thought that killing every Jew he could find would bring him satisfaction. Well, he was misguided. He was never going to be satisfied in that condition. So this is just a deep, deep confusion. But when we just rest, when we just allow things to be as they are, it's impossible to cause ourselves problems. And for you, reaching this level of awareness, was it a gradual thing or was it more of a the satori, the sudden awakening? Mm. It's a recognition thing. Now, I was involved in many different practices with many different teachers many different books, many different talks, many different guided meditations, many different solo techniques of meditation. In the earlier stages of that journey, I thought I was developing something. I thought I was getting to something. And many teachings indeed at least imply that there is something to be gained through these practices, that, that we are changing ourselves from a lesser being into a greater being. Well, this is a teaching of duality. We're still saying, we're judging. We're judging. We're saying, I'm rotten as I am, and I need to do all this work to fix myself up. When I discovered the non-dual teachings, then I discovered, oh, this is just about recognizing who I have always been. And then it just became about glimpsing that, glimpsing that, glimpsing that in as many moments as I could until it became clear that, see, a, a flip occurs at some point for each practitioner who does this, where it stops being recognizing awareness and it starts being, oh, why would I think that? Why would I be seduced by that gratification? Why would I judge this thing to be good or bad? We start to see all of the old mental scripts as extras. We begin from that position of extra and we think we're doing something to relax. But relaxing is not a doing. <laughs> relaxing is non-doing. So we flip at some point and we, re oh, relaxation is my default mode. 
well-being is my default mode. And then why would I ever do anything that would make me unwell? Why would I ever do anything to distract myself unduly? Why would I ever do anything to harm myself? Does that make sense? Yes, I, I'm following most. And a question that comes to mind, and I've been thinking about this for a while, is like sometimes when I tend very far towards the spiritual, the awareness side of things, I lose a little bit of the ambition to go after things in business and stuff. And so that's that's kind of a rabbit hole I want to go down. So mm. we know mm. to be happy, to be successful, we have to like we have to do hard things. We have to wake up, we have to uh, go to the gym, we have to eat clean. We have to work on our business, even when we're tired. So those things feel like pushing through resistance, right? Those things feel like mm. you have to kind of fight that resistance. But you're talking about our natural state of being is just relaxation. So how do you manage to do all those quote unquote disciplined acts despite being in this state of all is right or all is perfect, right? Because I know some people That's would just dismiss question. that is like, that's just woo woo. And you'll just like sit on the couch all day and never do anything. Right. So I'm really curious your take. Really important question. I asked that first teacher of mine one time, if the Buddha was completely satisfied, why did he walk up and down India giving thousands of teachings over 50 years? Why go to all that trouble? And my teacher said to me, he did that out of wisdom and compassion and discernment. He did it for mutual benefit. He saw that it was good to do, so he did it. Now, I had never considered the possibility of making a decision on that basis. Every decision I had made for the roughly 30 years of my life until I asked that question had been made on the basis of lack or on the basis of fear. I don't have something, I want to go and get it, so I need to do X, Y, and Z. Or if I don't do X, Y, Z, A, B, C will happen. And I don't want that. So I better do X, Y, Z. Or just on obligation, just people telling me should sorts and musts, right? If you want to be accepted, then you have to do this stuff. Well, when I heard how the Buddha did things, I started to consider, I wonder if I could do things that way. And so began a years long game of chicken with myself, brother. What happens when I relax? Can I trust that there is a natural compassion. Can I trust that compassion is the natural state of the human being, full stop? And that we will do good stuff when we're feeling okay in ourselves. Now, I worried for many years that I would just end up at the bar, a degenerate. <laughs> <laughs> what I found was the more I relaxed, the less I wanted to go to the bar. Because the reason for going to the bar is I feel like shit or I feel mildly like shit or I feel at least that, you know, the value equation that we're making is I'm going to feel better if I drink beer than if I don't. But if we raise our level of general satisfaction and that's not a raising, this is the subtractive model. We are satisfied by our nature when we're not dissatisfying ourselves. The Buddha said that all he ever taught was dissatisfaction and the end of dissatisfaction. To a huge assembly of monks that was so right there it is he's saying it, it's dissatisfaction is the extra thing i'm just teaching you how to not do that how to not wish things were different and when you don't wish things were different then everything's fine as it is when everything's fine as it is well we're kind of sat around and we think well what shall i do well might as well do something good we don't need that gratification that we needed so badly anymore See, it, it, I was certainly in the position where I felt, well, if, if, if I had nothing to do, I would just want to gratify myself. It's not the case. Again, we look to our sample of these hundreds of millions of monks and we see, I just want to help people. They're doing like minimal gratification. I certainly watch more TV than the monks do. <laughs> and that's included as well, right? So we don't have to give up all gratification. We can live as a regular human being doing regular human stuff. We just don't need it anymore. So naturally, we tend to do less of it. Sometimes I describe it like this. You don't need reasons to be kind. You need reasons to be unkind. 
So imagine you were sat on a park bench, perfectly content, not a care in the world. And a child approaches you and asks if you'll buy them lunch. Excuse me, I'm hungry. Can you buy me a sandwich? Right now, of course, you probably look for their parents first of all, right? But to make a simple illustration, of course, you're going to buy that kid the sandwich. You'd need a reason to not. You don't need a reason to buy a child a sandwich, right? Or to take care of them if they're in danger. And the same thing, it turns out, expands across the whole of humanity. So when I wake up in the morning, brother, I wake up early with no alarm. And I'm typically in the position of trying to stay in bed because I wake up so ready to come out and do this outreach and teach people about mindfulness and talk about all this stuff we're talking about here. That actually, if anything, the issue is I don't get enough sleep because I'm too excited to get up and get started. <laughs> and this is just, this is natural. This is all a result of me surrendering. You mentioned Michael Singer earlier on. Very similar thing going on for me right now. I'm certainly newer to the game than Mickey is, but you know he had that long, decades-long journey of the surrender experiment, right? Let me just, what happens if I just have no preference and I just do whatever's in front of me to the best of my ability? There's a natural energy that comes with that. In fact, I remember listening to his, his audio book, and I think it's him who's narrating it. And he was talking about uh, when he was learning to program. This was on the the kind of you, you read the book or or listened. Yeah, that, yeah, that book was very influential for me. I'll tell you why in a second. Sure, sure. So that image of him learning to program and just sitting up all night, right, getting very little sleep, waking up in the morning to do his practices, just impassioned, just ready, just felt right on. Now, in certain language, we could say because it was what the universe was presenting to him. Right. I tend not to use language like that because it it creates a duality between oneself and the universe. There's a universe and it's presenting something to us. Now, I know that Mickey understands this stuff. We have to use language in some way or we're not going to be able to communicate anything. But um, it's just a wonderful thing. And I encourage anyone who's listening to try it out. All I decided to do and all my teachers ever encouraged me to do was to try it out, to experiment. This is vital. Comes back to the direct experience thing. If we're doing this because someone said it's good for us, it's not going to have the same kind of steam. We want to be experimenting. Hey, what happens if I try a little of what Dan said in that podcast? What happens? And there may be layers of what we might call dissatisfaction to deal with. Most practitioners, you see, I said earlier on that I begin with students saying rest naturally without seeking or describing anything. And then I'll hear their objections. And over the course of time, I'll work with that student to find out where is their stash of attachment? Where is their stash of dissatisfaction? What is it that when they sit down and close their eyes and get quiet, what is it that bothers them? And then we'll work with that. And maybe a specific kind of sitting practice is suitable Maybe they need to hear something from a different perspective. Maybe they need to do a retreat. Maybe they need to, you know, there's any number of strategies that we could employ. Maybe something that looks more like psychology or self-help is appropriate for that student. Everything's available to us now in the 21st century. And that's one of the beautiful things about it. For sure. Yeah. So many things came up in my head as you were talking there. Um, the first one, I can touch on the Michael Singer book. Um, the surrender experiment really quick. So I was reading that book when I was in Costa Rica a couple of months ago and a, a very good friend via Twitter reached out to me and said he was doing an ayahuasca ceremony in Costa Rica and he invited me and my friend to go. And mm. my first reaction was, oh, I'm not ready. I'm scared. I'm too young. Like, I don't want to do this. I'm too focused on my work. But I was reading that book at the exact time that he asked and I was like, I'm just going to surrender to it. I'm just going to go with it. Despite every thought telling me not to, I'm just going to go with it. And I'm grateful I did because I learned so much about myself throughout that experience that I wouldn't have probably learned for years had I not done it. And it mm. was just about surrendering to whatever the universe was presenting me. Right. Um, mm. So that's what was really powerful about that book for me. I actually never finished it though. I felt like right after mm. that, I, I kind of got it. And I was very fascinated with his life story, but 
I might go back and finish it. Mm-hmm. One thing that you said that was really interesting too is the fact that you're waking up no alarm clock and you're just ready to go. And something I notice in myself is when I feel very aligned with like a mission and a purpose and my work, I'm doing that the same. Like I have an alarm set, but I'm getting up before the alarm. I'm excited to like get in the cold shower. I'm excited to go do the work. I look ahead to the day with a lot of excitement, like for calls, for podcasts, for everything, for a workout. But I sometimes oscillate back to that feeling of dread. Like even this Mm. morning, like I'll just be 100% transparent. My alarm went off and I laid in my bed for an hour because I was like, Mm. oh, I don't, I don't want to go do this. And uh, I have, I have a podcast and I have to get on a space and I have four calls in the afternoon. And it's that feeling of like, oh, there's just so much to be done and it can feel overwhelming. Mm. So I'm sure a lot of people out there feel the same way. Like, how can you stay in that alignment so that you see each day as exciting rather than Mm. dreading the day? Because it's something that I struggle with. Yeah, well, you you relax. And what is not aligned will fall away. Now, this takes a certain kind of courage. Though it's not a courage in terms of like a charging ahead, it's a courage. Again, we're looking at this subtractive model the kind of courage that you had when you went and did that ayahuasca ceremony, the surrender, right? For me, this showed up most notably when I was transitioning. I suppose this would mark the beginning of my transition out of my previous career, and it was a long transition. Maybe five years of transition, I suppose. My teenage ambition was to be the best drummer in the world. I played drums for 25 years. And I got very good. And I was playing in some really good bands. But I saw through my practice and through a lot of contemplation that those projects weren't serving me. I wasn't getting a lot of creative dividend. Uh, I wasn't able to play things in the way that I wanted to play them. Essentially, I'd become a session musician, like a mercenary of the musical world. And then even in the projects that were with friends, I found myself still fulfilling that role. I wasn't getting the creative kicks that I wanted. And I certainly wasn't getting paid because musicians don't get paid. (laughs) Very few of them do. And so I dropped those two projects. That meant letting go of that teenage ambition that I'd identified with for so long. Each project that I had been involved with as a musician was like a step up, right? So I was climbing in something. Yeah. Getting more and more high profile gigs. And then I quit these two that really kind of represented the whole journey. And I knew I wouldn't get back in, but it just became abundantly clear to me as I continued to practice that that was what I was to do. It was not aligned. And indeed, I saw in the course of time that that teenage ambition was just a terrible fit for who I really was at that time. I didn't care about proving myself anymore. I didn't care about impressing people anymore. So as I let go of more and more of that old career, I came further into alignment. That was not what Dan of six years ago would have ever accepted. No way. So as with Mickey Singer, that surrender experiment took him in some real unexpected directions. I never thought it was going to be possible to make a career out of teaching mindfulness because there are so many archaic ideas around, oh, well, money shouldn't be involved anywhere in the picture. Well, that's fine if we're all going to live in a big monastery and pool our resources. That's fine if there's a culture of generosity around us. There's not. We live in a different time, a different place. And so letting go of more and more and more and more and more and more until I even had to let go of that first teacher's ideas, even though he was greatly wise and incredibly beneficial to me, I had to let go of his ideas too, of his ideas of, well, money shouldn't be involved in this because I saw that it was hindering mutual benefit. And mutual benefit is the ultimate compass. What greater direction is there to live our lives by? And so, brother, if the things that you're doing in your day 
don't align with either your core values or these naturally occurring values like mutual benefit, compassion, wisdom, then you will struggle. Now, there is also the case of just simple fatigue, right? There is still this system here, you know, this thing in here does the processing as far as science can tell. And there's, we do need sleep, we do need nutrition and all of that. And if we're fatigued, if that system is run down, then that has certain effects. Now, it's interesting to apply the practice that we've been talking about that, because when you rest as awareness, you don't care about those effects. So I'm constantly thrilled by how well I can have these conversations, regardless of how much sleep I've had, regardless of if I'm hungry, regardless of if I've had enough sunlight exposure and all of that stuff. It's good to do that stuff. And this is another thing that we naturally tend towards. I never have a, a dialogue going about, should I go to the gym or can I be bothered to go to the gym today? I just go because it's just seemed to be, as you said, right, when we're in alignment, it's it's just part of the mission. And there's no greater mission for me, at least, than helping people to see this stuff that I've seen. I'm getting some amazing results, brother. I posted a video just this morning of a student who called me yesterday who reported full-blown spiritual awakening. We were laughing our heads off. We were going over teachings that I'd given him over the years. And he said, yeah, I hear it now. He said, it made no sense. All those times you told me again and again and again and again and again, it made no sense. And I struggled and struggled and struggled. Now I see. And this kind of illustrates the, the shortcomings of language. It's really impossible to describe this stuff. A famous teacher called Adi Ashanti said regarding giving these teachings, uh, his job is to fail well. I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We will never adequately describe these truths that we're talking about because language is dualistic. Just like Ramdas said, when we think, we think about things. When we talk, we talk about things. What we're talking about here is non-duality, the great unity of everything. And so language will never do it justice, but we try. And we go on this journey and we align, first of all, with our core values in the individual sense, right? What does Dan care about? What does Jack care about? But then we see there's there's something that precedes that, which is, what's my default mode? Is it compassionate? Let's find out. And if it is, that's tremendous energy for doing the things that we got to do. Now, the circumstances may have to change like mine did. I saw that I was of nowhere near as much benefit teaching people to play drums and performing as I was going to be teaching this stuff. And I would have experiences where, you know, music is a casual thing for most people. Most people would come to me for a drum lesson in the evenings or on the weekends. And uh, they wouldn't practice between those sessions, you know, so we would do the same material over and over again. And I had fun with them and it was fine. Good job. But more and more, my phone started to buzz in my pocket and it was a mindfulness student who'd had some deep realization in meditation that they wanted to debrief on or they'd had a panic attack or they'd just left their partner or any number of things that they really needed assistance with. And I'm thinking, well, here I am with this drum student going over the same material I've given them a dozen times. There's two things I could be doing with this moment. And so I need to figure out how I'm going to make that happen. And that was the beginning of this creator journey that we're both on. Wow. That's a crazy transition. And I can resonate a lot with the ambition to mm. climb up the ranks for you. It was drumming for me. It was sports football specifically. Mm. And I want to know your current take on ambition as a whole. Mm. Do you see it as something positive? Do you see it as something negative? Does it depend on what the ambition is aimed towards? Because mm. I, I hear a lot Pretty of conflicting much. teachings on this. Mm. It all depends on alignment. Again, if the ambition is aligned, you know, so I can write in my bio, I'm going to normalize well-being for one billion and one people. But I didn't come up with that in a sense. I came up with the words, but that, if you can call it an ambition, it came rather of me observing my behavior over a day, week, month, year, observing that, hey, there's a real strong 
a natural pull toward me teaching this mindfulness stuff. It's what I think about when I wake up. It's what I think about when I go to bed. It's what I want to help people with. And a huge, huge ingredient in this, brother, is my first experience teaching mindfulness was when my mother attempted suicide back in 2017. Or maybe that was 2016. Um, I taught her everything that I knew. That was the only way I knew to take care of her. And I saw this shit save her life. So how am I going to keep teaching drums? <laughs> how am I going to do anything else from then on? Right? And as I relaxed again, seeing this natural compassion arise, it's just a very natural thing. So, so that ambition, right? It looks like an ambition. That, so the difference is in contrivance. If we contrive an ambition for ourselves, then it has the potential to be out of alignment. Now we might, it's possible that they could line up. So someone might, for example, grow up in a family of spiritual practitioners who tell them you should be a mindfulness teacher. <laughs> right? And they might do it first of all out of obligation and then discover as they relax that, oh, this is actually a really good thing to do. This is actually, this This fires me up because I can see that there's mutual benefit here. I feel good when I teach. The students feel good when I teach them. So this is good. This is a wonderful thing. On the other hand, if you grow up in a family of solicitors and they're telling you, you got to go and study law and you're going to be a criminal defense lawyer, well, we can hear that's an easy one to point at and say, well, this is not in alignment with natural beneficial values. So that person's going to struggle. That person's going to have to effectively lie to themselves their whole lives in order to continue doing that work. Now, there is the case, of course, I don't want to be too uh, generalizing here. There is the case, of course, criminal defense. I don't know anything about law. Um, I don't know if that means the person who would defend anyone who's being prosecuted i don't know if you know this brother because of course someone needs to do that right so right. anyone can have an accusation come at them right and they need someone to defend them in court well that's a noble role but someone who's actually defending criminals i'm thinking of saul goodman from breaking bad here you know <laughs> there's someone who's really out of alignment with these natural positive values Makes and sense. for some yeah, it does for me, but I think I'm fortunate to be in a spot where my work allows me to be in alignment. And I think for a lot of people, they're in a situation in their job where all this mindfulness stuff, it just seems too abstract. It seems like it wouldn't yeah. help. I got a DM a couple of days ago. It was a pretty crazy DM. Somebody said to me, like my four-year-old son was just diagnosed with leukemia. He's like, your meditation isn't going to help that, is it? And I, I didn't answer because I didn't know how to. But like for that example, like what what's your take on mm. a statement like that and a situation like that? Because obviously that's a mm. horrible situation. Mm. Mm. It is a horrible situation. And it's important for us to be able to answer these kinds of questions. And my answer to that question would be, hmm, actually, now I consider it, there is some research that suggests that frame of mind can have real healing qualities. Now, I wouldn't be so bold as to suggest that if this person got their four-year-old meditating, that it would cure their leukemia. But what I could tell them for sure is that meditation and mindfulness would help them to deal with the tragedy. Would help them to find acceptance when they're ready and not rage against these circumstances, which are what they are. And normally with someone in that kind of position, we get into conversations around how resisting the situation, being angry about it, or being in denial or any of these responses that people take, they don't change the situation. Or if they do change the situation, the situation, they make it worse. Because we're running on anger, which just, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. So indeed, whether this youngster is to survive or not, let's give them a calm environment in which to have leukemia. Let's give them a positive, supporting, wholesome environment in which to have leukemia. Let's deal with our own 
resistances as they may be, our own objections to the situation, our anger, our grief, our fear, in such a way that we can make the situation not about us. If I'm angry, if I'm sad, if I'm fearful as my child is sick, why well, I'm making it about me. If I can learn to let go of all of that stuff, then I can just get down to the business of being the best parent I can, regardless of how the situation plays out. That's great. Yeah, that's a mm. phenomenal answer. Much better one than I could have crafted up. Well, I've had um, some practice, um, exactly. but also I would be very sensitive with someone in that position to say to them, it is totally okay to feel angry. Mm -hmm. It is totally okay to rage against this situation. It's okay to feel sad. It's only in the acceptance of these emotions that we can ever release them anyway. Mm -hmm. If we suppress them, if we resist the emotions themselves, we're just in the cycle of creating more and more juice. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that. Now I want to, I want to pivot the conversation a little bit more towards creator economy stuff. So mm. I guess we could start with this as an entrepreneur or a creator. I feel so many struggle with being overwhelmed, being burnt out, et cetera. And I know a lot of people would like to have a meditation mindfulness practice, but they're like, I don't have time. So, mm. you know, to one of those people, like, why should they make time for these practices and how could they benefit from making it a consistent thing? Mm. So consider two individuals with the same workload. One is cool as a cucumber and the other's pulling their hair out. We've all seen this happen or something similar, right? We know, we know categorically that it's not about circumstances. It's not about the workload itself, although we can say that there would be a pattern, right? Most people with a greater workload would feel overwhelmed. Most people with a lesser workload would not feel overwhelmed. However, we see great examples of people with heavy, heavy workloads not being overwhelmed. So we know it's possible. Now we might say, oh, well, it's genetics. You know, this person's special. Well, where does that leave us? <laughs> if we put it down to genetics, if we say there's nothing I can do about it, well, we're fucked anyway. So what I would say to this person is start small. Everyone takes a shit. So instead of being on the phone, do a shitting meditation like I mentioned earlier, right? Shower meditation, stack them up right now. Yes, you'll have to invest some time to begin with to figure out what the hell meditation is and how to do it. But there's no end of resources these days. I think it's important for people to get a sense of the ROI, right? So, you know, I spoke earlier about how easy it is for me to get up. In fact, too easy, if anything, for me to get up and start working. And I will typically work 12 hours in a day, work. And I don't experience it as work. Now, some of it isn't jobs that I would necessarily choose to do this week, every morning before I do anything else. I've been checking in with my accountant and doing my accounts. By no means is that my favorite job. But a, as part of the mission, it makes sense. But B, the mindfulness stuff just, it's acceptance. Mindfulness is acceptance. And so what is to be done is just done. I remember a time working on accounts again. I used to have a really bad time doing my accounts. Mega, mega stress, mega stress. I would hurt myself. So the big problem that got me into all of this, brother, was tension. I had a lot of pain in my upper back and I discovered that it was tension and that that tension was caused by stress. When I was doing my taxes, oh man, my back was on fire. So stressed out. I am not a numbers guy by nature. You know, we're talking about how words are to put labels on things. Well, how about a spreadsheet full of fucking transactions with dollars and cents, in my case, pounds and pennies. You know, it's so like reified. It's so you're quantifying everything. And there's something in that. However, one year, maybe about one year into my mindfulness practice, I decided it's time to do my tax return. I'm going to put on some meditation music and I'm going to do a tax return meditation. 
but that's what I did. And it was completely different to every other time I've ever done my tax return. And here's the kicker. I got it done faster. So that's the answer for these folks who think I don't have time to meditate. It will have an ROI and you can hold me to that, dear friends. <laughs> Anyone out there who's listening who wants to hold me accountable to this statement that if you learn meditation and mindfulness and you apply it correctly, you will get things done quicker. You will earn more money. Now, of course, you know, there's <laughs> lots of different things people could be doing with their time to get the money. So I'm not talking about making a business plan for people, but assuming the business plan is sound, one's execution with mindfulness in the picture will be better. And that will result in that most uh, obvious of metrics for most people, more dollars. I've seen yeah. it happen. The tax stuff is especially relevant for me to keep in mind because this upcoming year, I'm going to have to do my first tax returns like all, I, and I have no idea what I'm doing, literally no idea. And even the mm -hmm. thought of it, like I feel some anxiety building in my stomach and my chest. Yeah. Um, yeah. But approaching it from that lens of like, it's all fine. Like it's all okay. It can get done. You can do it. You're capable of doing it. And it will be easier every subsequent time. I'm going to keep that in mind. I might text you around tax season for a reminder. Um, sure, brother. <laughs> but I want, uh, another quick question on the creator economy. I notice sometimes it can be so stimulating, like all the notifications, all the replies, all the messages, right? Like, how do you monitor that stimulation and dopamine? Because I feel like it, it can be so overloading at times and it can really mess with me. Mm, mm. I don't really experience those dopamine spikes anymore. And my best guess as to why is because I don't really care what's behind the not notifications. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to be good regardless, right? So whatever that DM says, however many DMs are there, however many notifications are there, however many new followers there are, right? It, it doesn't affect me. Now, this is this is a good point for illustration as well. That doesn't mean that I don't want more followers. I want more followers because I know that it's good on the basis of mutual benefit for me to build an audience, right? I don't want more followers because it makes me feel good to have followers. Yeah. Right. And when we've, again, it's like we've pulled the rug out from under the whole thing. When I don't care on a personal level, how it goes, when I'm not attaching my emotions to those notifications and what's behind them, then I'm free. And that That's is the subject. Yeah. yeah, that is the subject of these labels, descriptions, judgments, and interpretations that we were talking about earlier on. We make the interpretation culturally. I am worth more if I have a large following on social media. I'm a more worthy person. I have higher value as an individual if I have a large following on social media. So that's, you know, when we're in that mode, we're fucked. But that is an interpretation. Because actually, all, all it is, is a number. That's all it is. We're just seeing pixels on a screen. It is. <laughs> it has no meaning beyond what we invest in it. And so when we stop investing, we're free. I love that. And it is such a tricky game because, like you said, on the one hand, you want more followers, right? Because you're going to impact more people but you have to approach it from that sense of detachment. Like I'm already complete without it. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that I'm trying to keep top of mind. And, you know, sometimes you do get caught in it. Like, oh, this post got me in a couple hundred followers. Like, let's go. I feel really good about myself. But mm. when you feel good about yourself, when you're giving those things that power, when you're giving encouraging comments power you're also giving negative comments power too right so right the better way to approach it is just complete detachment um which is really yeah. interesting and that doesn't mean we don't get to feel good when a post does well right but it's a different kind of it's how we can imagine the buddha felt good when he was teaching right oh i'm doing mutual benefit right now i'm giving something of value Mm -hmm. 
and I get to receive something of value in return. This is a good thing. It's natural to feel good. Yeah, that's a good right? framework for like when you're posting. Mm. It's like, what is the motive behind this post? Is it actually encouraging, educating, or inspiring somebody? Or is it posted because I think it will get a lot of likes? That's a really good frame to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. And do I want those likes because I'm going to feel more worthy if I get them? Mm. Right. Yeah, it's all this mind game. It's crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it, brother? It is. But that's why it's great to have these conversations because if you don't, that's why I really believe like whether it's spirituality, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's philosophical, you need to have some greater frame to play this game through or else how do you not drown in the hedonism of more followers, more likes, more money, more influence, more status? And we all know where that game is going to end. It's going to end in, oh, wait, this is all there is, or I feel completely empty, right? So it's really why I believe that every brand or every person, again, should is a powerful word, but like should at least consider adding in that element to their brand and business or else how does it not become meaningless? Indeed. Or how about again, running an experiment? Right. This is mm -hmm. how I kind of encourage people who perhaps aren't super keen in the beginning. Hey, just just experiment with it. See what happens. Yeah. See what happens. We know mindfulness has never harmed anyone. Right. Yeah. So there's nothing <laughs> to lose. You know, if it's the time thing, well, a lot of people a lot of people come to this practice after a burnout or after some tragedy or after something that's just really made it clear to them that they have to change something. And so for those of you out there who are kind of thinking about mindfulness, oh, I should be doing mindfulness, or I've heard that mindfulness is really good. I feel like I want to check it out, but I don't have time. Maybe there's just not enough reason for you to try it yet. But when there is enough reason, then all you have to do is experiment a little. Do a one minute meditation once a day. And it's, you know, it feels like, oh, but that's another thing that I've got to put on the to-do list. Well, this is something that, that must exist outside of the to-do list. This is not a to-do list item. It is not a chore. If this is done like a chore, if it's done like getting on the exercise bike, it, it won't last. This is about realizing what it is that encompasses all of your experience, the exercise bike, the create a game, writing, being with family, sleeping, eating, all of it. So th this, this recognition is the very most important recognition that someone could make in their lifetime is who they really are. It's the ultimate frame, the frameless frame. It's the frame in which all frames are contained. <laughs> I feel like that's the beginning of a rap song, maybe. <laughs> I like that. I like that concept, actually. The frameless frame. There's a book called The Pathless Path by this guy yeah. named Paul Millard. That just came to mind. That book changed my life. So maybe... That's a little hint at a future book for you or something. Maybe, brother. Maybe. Listen, how you doing for time? I think it's about time for me to get on. Yeah, I was literally just going to wrap it up with that last comment. I was going to say, if you're interested in uh, mindfulness within the creator economy, or if you're out of the creator economy, Dan is your guy. Like, I'll link all this stuff below, but I wanted to turn it back to you for one last question. Where can people find you at and what can they expect of you in the future? Are you working on anything? What's the deal? Mm, mm. So I'm mostly on X. That's where I spend most of my time. I'm branching out to Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok. So I am there at It's Dan Goldfield on all platforms. I write a newsletter weekly. You can get that at dangoldfield.com. And the next big thing that I'll be doing is I'll be running my cohort again in January. Date to be confirmed. That's the mindful 24 seven cohort where I take students through exactly what Jack and I have been talking about today, dissolving that boundary between meditation and non-meditation, making it a way of life so that you eventually don't have to make time for meditation because you're meditating all the time. <laughs> That's the idea. So we'll be running that cohort in January until then. If someone wants to talk one-to-one, -one, they can reach out to me. I'm always open for coaching. And I'll be pleased to hear from anyone, even if they don't want to do anything on a, on a deeper level. If someone has thoughts about our conversation today, then of course they can reach out anywhere. Awesome. Thank you, man. This was a phenomenal conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. 
I appreciate you having me, brother. Really enjoyed it. We'll have to do another one at some point in the future, for sure. I'll look forward to it. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Dan.